So we've heard a lot about keratoconus today, and our goal in the treatment of patients with keratoconus is to make your vision as good as we can, to get you comfortable, to get through the day, to keep up your lifestyle. Um, but sometimes you'll reach a point where whatever has been done is not acceptable for you, whether the contact lenses are uncomfortable, whether you're not a candidate for intacts, uh, whether cross-linking worked for a while or didn't work, whatever, every eye is different. Even your two eyes, if you have keratoconus in both eyes, you'll have a different visual experience in the two eyes even with wearing contact lenses. As far as wearing glasses, you know, there are really no rules other than trying to get you to the best vision. And sometimes patients wearing contact lenses will also wear glasses because they'll get a little bit better vision. Um, and, and if that works, that's, that's what we want to do. So if it comes to the point where you're just not able to get through your day, you can't do the things you want to do, then having a corneal, corneal transplant may be the way to go, and the only way to know that is to talk to your ophthalmologist and see whether, you know, whether it's time to do that. Uh, but don't be afraid of having a corneal transplant because they work wonderfully. So in so what is a corneal transplant? So a corneal transplant is where we remove roughly 70% of the central part of your cornea and re we replace it with a donor cornea from another person. Treatment of corneal scars, so with keratoconus you can get scarring at the apex, goes back to 1500 BC. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but basically at that point there was no surgery and the only thing they could do is cover up the scar. So they could grind a little bit of soot into the white scar and make it darker and so that it was more cosmetically acceptable. Um, later on, tattooing became available and, those, and the scars could be tattooed. Transplants first started in 17 and 1800s, the thought of them, and some experimentation on animals occurred, but none were, were successful. Um, in 1838, Dr. Kisman in New York did a poor sign to human transplant, did not work. By the way, there was no anesthesia at that time, so you can imagine that was a real fun procedure to go through. So general anesthesia first came about in the, in the mid-1800s. Um, late 1800s was a, a lamellar transplant that was done where there was some improvement in vision. Dr. Uh, Hirsch actually uh, mentioned DALC, which is essentially a, a type of lamellar transplant. Um, but at any rate, in 1905, uh, Edward uh, Zerm of Czechoslovakia actually was the first person to perform a full thickness corneal transplant on a 43-year-old. Um, and it, the donor was a, a, a patient who died uh, accidental death. Um, again, things were very different then, so the donor and the recipient were in the operating room, same operating room at the same time. And so the donor cornea was taken from, uh, from the donor patient and, and then transplanted into the recipient. There were no fine sutures at that time. So the only way to hold things in place basically was to close the eye, put the person in bed with a sandbag on either side of their head, and they stayed there for about 10 days. Um, and hopefully they didn't develop an infection and other problems. Um, but in this case, uh, Dr. Zerm had a successful transplant and, and the patient did have improvement in vision. In the United States, we had a, a surgeon, Ramon Costa de Viejo. Viejo um, his office was in New York on Park Avenue. Um, he was a major influence on surgery in the United States, developed many instruments that are still in use today. Um, interestingly, at that time, we didn't have much in the way of fine surgical knives. Uh, to use, and this uh, artist's rendition came out of an article of his um, where he described using a device that he developed that would break a safety razor, what you'd use to shave, in order to make a smaller blade that you could use to do a corneal transplant. And one of the devices he developed was actually would hold two blades so that you could make parallel cuts, and then if you turned it 90 degrees and cut again, you end up with a square graft. And the early grafts were square. Dr. Castro Viejo actually did surgery in his living room at times on Park Avenue. This photograph is a patient who was one of his 
early surgeries um, was done by Dr. Castro Viejo in his living room. Um, and uh, this picture goes back about 10 years. This gentleman's now retired in, in uh, Virginia, but still has a clear graft. Corneal transplant surgery actually became more popular after World War II um, when steroids, antibiotics, and finer sutures started to become available. Uh, so uh, antibiotics first available, uh, you know, at that time, topical antibiotics and topical steroids. The first eye bank was established by R. Townley Patton in New York, uh, the eye bank for site restoration. They're still, still around, a uh, very active eye bank. Um, the early corneas were obtained from Sing Sing Sig uh, Sir <laughs> Sing Sing. Um, oh my goodness, uh, prison. <laughs> okay, from death row inmates. Um, things have changed a lot in eye banking since that time. Uh, so an eye bank is is a collection, an organization of administration, laboratory, and technical personnel operated in accordance of supervising agencies, the iBank Association of America, the FDA, in our case in New Jersey, we're part of Eversight, uh, we're Eversight New Jersey, um, but we have uh, about eight member iBanks. Um, we interface, the iBank interfaces with local hospital and transplant uh, organizations in order to provide ocular tissue uh, needed for surgery. So, not only do we provide corneal tissue, both layered corneal tissue, full thickness corneal tissue, but also the scleral tissue, the white part of the eye, is also used for various types of surgery for reconstruction. Uh, not only in ophthalmology, but in plastic surgery and ENT, um, scleras use glaucoma surgery as well. In New Jersey, we have required request, which basically means that anybody who passes away, it's required of the hospital or the facility that they're first brought to to ask the, the family whether they would like to be a donor for anything, whether it be eye tissue or skin or bone or, or uh, other organs. Um, other states have, have different uh, regulations. We can do transplants on any donor under the age of 75. Generally, anything older than that is used for research only. Um, interestingly enough, there's been a study going on now for over 10 years looking at the age of the donor and the success of the cornea because your thought process would be that you want as young a cornea as possible. But the truth is the studies have shown that there is no difference in age versus the success rate of the corneal transplant. That being said, I generally wouldn't take a 20-year-old patient and give them a 75-year-old cornea because it just doesn't make sense by the time they're in their, their, later, in their later years, they're going to have an extremely old cornea. Um, we need referral in a relatively short period of time, six to eight hours. Uh, we generally recover before 20 hours after death. Um, uh, we need to protect the, the corneas or the nurses need to protect the corneas on somebody passes away so the eyes aren't left open so they dry out. That creates risk of infection and other problems. So when death occurs, there's a call made in New Jersey to the sharing network. They do an initial screening. If the family is agreeable, then the eye bank will actually get the uh, initial consent from the, fa uh, from the uh, family. Um, a technician is sent to the hospital and there's a full medical chart review. We get the consent sign, blood is drawn for testing, and then the either whole eye or corneas only are harvested according to the uh, donor's family's uh, wishes. So the tissue has to be examined, testing has to be done, we, we have to rule out um, infectious diseases, we have to know the social history and, as well as the medical history of the of the person, we have a slew of things that will um, will prevent us from using tissue that are contraindications for the use of the tissue. Um, all of the paperwork has to be done, uh, the I's dotted, the T's crossed before it's going to be offered for use. Um, preservation of the cornea, what do we do with the tissue? So initially, when eye banks were first established, we had nothing. So they'd get a whole globe, they'd put it in a closed container, and they'd keep it cold. They'd put a little bit of saline on it, salt water, um, but it had to be used right away. 
So over the course of, of time, we have evolved from using no media to media now that will keep a cornea good for about two weeks from the time of death. So that's changed surgery dr dramatically in the world, particularly in the United States. Um, in as recently as the, as the mid 80s, most of the surgery I was doing was evenings, holidays, weekends, because that's when tissue became available. Um, and so you did the, the surgery when you had the tissue. Now pretty much patients can select when they want to have their surgery and almost always we get tissue for them at their, at their selected uh, time. So over the course of the year, this is just a timeline showing what's happened. On the right here is a change in the regulations and the amount of testing that's been done. So we went from doing no testing on donors, um, just having a history to a lot of testing that's done. So it's really changed uh, the, the status of eye banking in, in the United States. One of the examinations we do is, is to carefully look at the cornea after it's been procured. So this is a, a photograph of a cornea in the Optisol in this preservation media. It's actually mounted on a piece of equipment that measures the thickness of the cornea. So we do a lot of care, careful observation. We do cell counts so we know what the, the cell density is of the cells that are being transplanted. So all of the information is entered into the uh, computer database um, and it's uh, distributed by a central location. So you as a patient go on the list, not necessarily the surgeon is associated with your name, but you as the patient are the primary person on the list. Uh, everything's tried, is done in a very fair manner. Uh, tissues tried to be distributed geographically, so if you're in New Jersey, the odds are you're going to get a donor from New Jersey, but you could well get a donor from another state, depending upon the availability, um, which is one of the advantages of having the tissue media that we can store the cornea in so we can uh, transport it. In 2014, we did about 46,500 corneas uh, transplanted in the United States. Uh, iBanks provided also corneal tissue for um, research, uh, for training for eye residents, um, and, uh, and very important function. So annually, this shows you, I just picked two years, um, 2005 to 2014, the number of corneal transplants increased but the number of penetrating keratoplasties decreased. So we're in a situation now where we're moving from full thickness corneal transplants to layered corneal transplants uh, when we can. Um, in keratoconus, still probably the best way to go is a penetrating keratoplasty, but again, every patient's an individual and every eye needs to be looked at individually to know what's the best procedure for, it, for the patient. Keratoconus makes up about 20% of, of the corneals, uh, corneal transplants done uh, for penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, the reason, uh, again, for the decrease in the number of penetrating keratoplasties is sometimes you get problems with the inner layers of the cornea, those cells that we transplant, which are not working well in certain dystrophies um, and conditions, and we can just transplant the posterior layer of the cornea instead of the full thickness. Uh, layer and uh, because that's a fairly common reason for surgeries to be done that's why the weight has shifted so that penetrating keratoplasty is now about half the, the volume of what it was. Uh, the anterior lamellar surgeries again that, that Dr. Hirsch had mentioned DALC um, it have been increasing there are still issues with it and that they are mostly related to the interface between the donor tissue and your own tissue that's left um, techniques are still evolving for the best way to do that. Um, the advantage is you have less antigenic tissue. The, the incidence of rejection would be much less with an, anti and, um, sorry, an anterior lamellar tissue transplant as opposed to a full thickness transplant. But the optical qualities may not be as good, so there's a, there's a balance there. Uh, recipients by age, basically in the 40 to 60, 70 age group, it makes up by far the bulk of, of the uh, transplants that are done. So surgery. So when we do surgery, what we need to do is we need to make an excision of the patient's cornea 
we need to prepare a donor cornea, and because we don't transplant the whole thing, we need to cut that and, and do what's called a button cut. Uh, there are many different ways to do that, um, and so that's something that's decided by the surgeon and, and what works best for, for them. So this is a case of, of somebody with uh, keratoconus. The, this way. The, the white haze you see here is actually a, a burn mark. So you know from some of the previous um, talks that we've had that the shape of the cornea is kind of irregular. You get this cone that bumps out in keratoconus. One of the things that we do is when we want to prepare or make an excision of that pathology is we want a nice straight cut. And if the cornea is too irregular, it's hard to do. So by creating a burn, it causes tissue to shrink and it flattens the cone so that when we put the tree, tree fine on, that's the blade that actually makes the cut, we get a nice clean cut. So this is the tree fine in place. This is a suction tree fine. It's held in place perpendicular to the corneal surface. And the little tabs that you see uh, up here actually spin. It's a threaded uh, device. So as you spin it, the knife cuts down. And it's a nice, uh, even cut. So this is after the cut has been made. And you can see the cut here. And then we finish excising it. And we put in the donor cornea. And then it has to be sutured in place. And so now we become a tailor or a seamstress, and we've got to put all these sutures in place. There are many different uh, suturing techniques that are used. Everybody kind of has their favorite um, as far as what the post-op results are and how much astigmatism and irregularity that you get um, in the surface. So once all the st stitches are put in, we can kind of go through this fast. Then you want to be sure the wound is tight and there are no leaks. Afterwards, antibiotic drops, anti-inflammatory medication. The post-op visits are more frequent in the immediate post-op period and then get spread out over time. Uh, generally, it's three to four months before you're ready for your first pair of glasses, although sometimes we'll fit with soft contact lenses in the, in the post-op period, depending upon what the patient's needs are. Some of the stitches remain in place for a full year. The success rate's very high. It's over 90%, close to 94%, depending upon what study you look at. Um, although the rejection rate is fairly low, if a rejection is caught early, nine out of 10 times, we can reverse it with topical medication. Um, if it goes too long, then, then it's not uh, reversible, but the surgery is repeatable. So patients can have more than one corneal transplant in the event that there is a, an untoward problem. And that's it.